if there was something someone could have said or done to change the path that led you here, what would it be? Ah, the power of if. If I could lose that 10 pounds. If I won the lottery. If. Now, if can be an excuse, or if can be a hope giver. I never thought if could be a key to reducing incarceration. Hi, my name is Kim Boguki, and I'm a 25-year veteran of the Seattle Police Department and the co-founder of the IF Project. I started the IF Project with what many would consider an unlikely alliance, cop and convict, standing side by side with one common goal, how to prevent young folks from taking the path to incarceration. And we're achieving this today by simply sharing stories and experiences. Let me tell you how it began. Six years ago, I was asked to work with a group of girls whose mothers were incarcerated. 1.7 million children in the United States have a parent that's incarcerated. We know that children of incarcerated parents are more likely to drop out of school, engage in delinquent behavior, and subsequently become incarcerated themselves. This was definitely a group of girls that I wanted to work with. But first, I wanted to ask their mother's permission. So I went into WCCW, Washington State Correction Center for Women, to ask that permission and also to assure those mothers that I was not going to say anything negative to their daughters about them because they were incarcerated. <laughs> that first day I walked into prison, I was nervous. A little bit like I am today. You know, I didn't have a badge or a gun. And honestly, I felt extremely vulnerable. That day is permanently etched in my mind. When I crossed over the threshold into the room to meet those mothers, I had to do a gut check. That is not what I expected. Those mothers look like you and me and my friends and family, people I would hang out with, not what I had remembered arresting for 20 years and not what I'd seen on reality TV or the news. And I realized at that moment, the things that I had seen and experienced, I had forgotten the simple thing that we're all just human. That first meeting is a little bit of a blur. The atmosphere in the room, however, was definitely chilly. Those women did not like the police. But what broke the ice was interesting. I started asking about their children. And I said, would your children call the police if they were a victim of a crime, or if they're harmed? The mom hats came on. We had a real interesting discussion about law enforcement. I said, you know what, Kim? We've taught our children to lie to the police, to hate the police, to not answer the door when you're at it, never to think of the police as a resource. <laughs> I didn't really know how to respond to that, but what they did changed everything for me. They started telling me about their lives. And I realized something didn't work for them. So I randomly asked what would become the if question, which was, if there was something somebody could have said or done to change the path that led you here, what would it have been? Silence is all I got on that day. Unbeknownst to me, asking that question would change all of our lives forever. I returned two months later to WCCW for a Girl Scout Beyond Bar sleepover. I have spent one night in prison. <laughs> I do not want to repeat that, because not having good coffee in the morning is not good for this cop. <laughs> but one of the inmates, named Renata, walked up to me and said, Kim, do you remember that question you asked us in that mother's meeting? She said, nobody asks us that question. They ask us what we did and how much time we got. And if they care enough to ask why we did it, we answer in the immediacy of the crime. I needed dope, I robbed the 7-Eleven. Not why did I need the dope in the first place. Ugh. And then she did something that I'll never forget. Uh, this, uh, it's been six years and it still affects me. She handed me a stack of papers that were handwritten answers to that if question from the women in WCCW. I can't explain to you what it felt like when those papers left her hands and came to mine. All I can tell you is that uh, it was one of the most transformational moments in my life and definitely in my career. Those answers were real. 
They were raw, riveting, reflective. They were painful. They were not blaming. They were selfless. These women had written those answers down in hopes that some young person would read them and make a different choice, not follow in their footsteps to prison. <laughs> and the IF project was born. To date, I still can't read the answers inside the prison. I get emotional. Even cops cry. We have over 3,000 handwritten answers to that IF question from people that are incarcerated. And I want to take a quick second and thank each and every one of you, because some of you are in this room, for putting pen to paper, and sometimes it's been pencil to napkin, and answering that question. Does anybody in this room have an idea what the number one answer to that if question would be? Holler it out. Parenting, affection, love. Number one answer, no positive adult role model. No one to guide me. No one to listen to me, and sometimes it was as simple as no one was kind to me. No mentor. I'm going to take a quick second and talk about mentoring. For those of you in this room that are mentor, thank you. You are making a huge difference. For those of you that are parents, you don't think you have time to mentor? Is there that child that loves to be at your house for dinner or spend the night? You have the opportunity to indirectly mentor them. And for those of you whose child's down the street at somebody else's house, Know who's mentoring your child. It takes a village and we're all in this together. In the evolution of the IF project, I have an amazing speaking team, the IF team. They're comprised of men and women that have been previously incarcerated from everything from drugs to theft to murder. Now, some people wouldn't want to spend time in the room with a felon. <laughs> some people wouldn't want to spend time in the room with a cop either. So we have that in common. <laughs> But we actually get along really well, and we're like family. We go out into our communities, and we do youth workshops. And I'll tell you, when that former prisoner starts sharing their story, everything changes. In 25 years of police work, I have never seen kids ever lean in, lean forward, get engaged, get connected, and ask for help like I have with this project. And when I say this project, make no mistake, the magic of this project is when that former prisoner starts sharing their story from their heart. Not yelling and screaming, that doesn't work. From their heart, when they're vulnerable. It allows those kids to be vulnerable and open up and share their stories and ask for help. Because what do we want young folks to do? We want them to stop, listen hopefully to what we're saying, think about what's going on in their life, and make positive choices so they don't end up in the back of my patrol car or following my team's footsteps to prison. And then there's another thing that happens. When they see cop and convict side by side saying, hey, how can we help you? It blurs those us and them lines that we've created in society. And it creates a community, a community of positive change. And for the if speaker, when they're sharing their story and a kid asks for help, they get to see hope. <laughs> they get to take that negative and turn it into a positive. They get a little silver lining of redemption. And they get to give back to a community that they've quite possibly taken something from. And for the, for the inmate that's not getting out of prison, they get to give back from behind these bars and make a difference. I'm going to tell you a real quick story about one of the guys on my speaking team. His name is Dolphy. Some of you guys might know him in here as Blue. Dolphy, at 16 years old, started a 26-year sentence in this institution. When Dolphy says 16 years old and 26, everybody in the room is listening, and he's got those kids. And what he's able to do with his stories, he's able to weave in what worked for him. It was books. It was the power of knowledge. It was education. Then he goes on to say, after he served 21 years and eight months, he did two things. He got out. He enrolled in community college, and he joined the IF team. Not only did he enroll in community college, he graduated in community college with honors. He doesn't like to say this, but I make sure the kids know it, with one of three presidential medals. And now, he works in an agency that helps get housing for people that have been in prison and have chemical dependency issues. But Dolby's not done, because he's also currently enrolled in the University of Washington, and he is proud to tell the kids he's a Husky. 
So what he gets to do is he gets to tell the kids that school and education and books and knowledge is a way out of what they're doing. And then there's that kid. Whoa. We've never had a kid like him before, or so we thought. We didn't know what we were going to do with him. He wasn't engaging, he wasn't connecting, and quite honestly, I wondered how long it was going to be before he ended up in handcuffs. And then I got the text. I said, hey, remember me? Of course we remembered you. <laughs> he said, I was at an IF project workshop five months ago, and I just wanted to say thanks. I went back to school the next day. I'm graduating next month. Would you guys come to graduation? Yeah. It worked. It worked. It works. In the United States, on the average, it's $32,000 a year to keep one adult incarcerated. In Washington State, we're paying $47,000 a year. When I hear people say, lock them up, throw away the key, I want to say, wait, 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 wait. Is that how you want to spend your tax dollars? Wouldn't it be better to spend your money on intervention, prevention, or education instead of having to care for those that are incarcerated? Wouldn't it? Ninety-five percent of people in the United States that are incarcerated are getting out of prison. Ninety-five percent of people in the United States that are incarcerated are returning to communities. It is not easy when they get out. I've walked with quite a few of them. They get out with that big scarlet F on their chest for felon. You and I can't see it, but they feel it. Every time they gotta check the felon box when they need a job, check the felon box when they need housing. Is it possible we can look beyond that felon box and see the person, give them a job, give them housing, two basic needs? I'm not here to tell you that everybody should get out of prison. And I'm not here to justify any crimes that have been committed. And I'm most certainly not here to ever take away from what a crime victim experienced or felt. We're trying to reduce those experiences. The IF project is powerful. OK, I'm going to admit it. I love coming to prison. <laughs> I do. I get to go home. But I love coming to prison. And I love talking to the inmates. They are a plethora of knowledge and insight. And when I come and have a conversation with them, no cell phones, no pagers, no multitasking, one-on-one, -on -one, real, honest conversation, becoming a lost art on the outside. The things that I have learned from people that have been in prison and that are getting out of prison have changed me. They've made me a better person and a much better police officer. Speaking of police officers, like prisoners, we're human too. And I've had conversations with fellow law enforcement, and they've said how the IF project has affected them. I recently got an email at 2 in the morning. Hey, Kim, I was on the IF project website, and I saw your video. I was unusually moved. <laughs> Me. You mean you cried? <laughs> Folks, you would be hard pressed to find a police officer that at some point in their career doesn't look in the back of their patrol car and wonder what in the heck happened that led this person to the back of my patrol car. And this project gives us those answers. It makes us better understand the communities that we serve and it makes us more compassionate in the work that we do, both on and off duty. There is value behind these walls in the stories of people that have lived the path, sharing them with those that could possibly follow that path. I'm asking you to let go of your judgments and your fear, just a little. Not an easy thing, I know, but if a 25-year veteran of a police department can do it, can you? We need to stop looking at the prison population as problem makers and start looking at them as problem solvers problem solvers to this mass epidemic of incarceration. So what can you do? Number one, be a mentor. Get involved in a child's life. Show up, put your phone down, connect, listen. Get involved with youth. Give a job to somebody that has to check that felon box. 
give shelter to somebody that has to check that felon box. But let's not overlook the simpler things. You can change your perception. You can look beyond the label and see the person. The one that looks just like you and just like me. Thank you.